she's going to be talking to us about um, her experience with flipping um, a large enrollment, and when I say large enrollment, it's large enrollment for engineering, right? Uh, a classroom, uh, keeping the, the hands-on uh, portions of it um, still in the class, even though it's a flipped classroom. Oh, well, it did not have hands off. That's, okay, well, that's a new thing. All right, well, you're going to tell us a little bit. She's going to tell us a little bit about her experience with building the classrooms. Okay, thank you. So I see a few faces I recognize, but with the large enrollment, I don't recognize everybody here who was. So who was in my field class before? Okay. Um, before flipping or after flipping? Before. 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 After? Okay. Last fall? Yeah. Okay, that was still the total chaos semester. <laughs> of course, that was the first one. Um, so, um, yes, where we, what I will do here is I will start a little bit telling you where we come from and what I changed before even flipping. And then I will go in how I tried to do the flipping, why I did this, and how I did get there and work from there. So, in the history, or what you want to see, is that it is, first of all, it's a service class. So, as you know, that it's always the classes where you are the major in that get from the department itself all these resources and whatever. If it's a service class, it's harder. So, a class this size within your department would probably a long time ago have been split in at least two field sections and so forth. But here, it didn't really happen. Um, it is a required class for mechanical engineers. BAE, so you guys, and then materials, and they have this as part of them as a prerequisite for another class. Mechanical and engineers, I know for sure, they have it as in their first semester junior class because they have another class which is required for in their second semester junior class, and then that one is a prereq for their senior design. So it's, it's quite some lead time even to go there. So it's important for them also to get this class. And I think for you it's uh, the prereq for another instrumentation class, right? So, um, and there are a few who choose it as a tech elective. So we have a few computer science people, sometimes in math, or bio, I had a biology major once. So overall it's, it's, it's mainly the required, and from that the majority is mechanical engineering. So I think like 8% of the people in the class are So I've been teaching this since 2005, one way or the other. Uh, in 2005, I looked up the numbers at one point. I had 45 to 50 in the fall, and I had 25 to 30 in the spring. Uh, in 2015, I had in the end 144 in the fall, and 78 in the spring, and then I did 15 in the summer, and then you saw my clothes. So it's kind of like exploded in a way that nobody really foresaw, but all these, you have to have bigger enrollment and so forth, of course it went in that direction. So the basic changes I made over the time was that, so I'm European, I went in Germany, did all my education in Germany, and when I first instructed there my first uh, international class, the students asked me for the course, the textbook, and I never understood what they wanted with the textbook, but now I know what, somebody asked me if they want a textbook. Uh, in Germany it's Typical that you have your own notes, the professor has notes, or maybe their own cheap variation of a book, but that's usually what's there, and that's what they lecture off. And then there is a list of recommendations which you can get in the library or we'll buy if you want to, but you're not required to buy it. I was not extremely happy with the book, so my notes um, were the ones because, because I also thought, okay, they're not maintenance, right? You don't want to keep this book, so why would you want to buy 120? dollar book, I don't like, you don't like, so there are my notes, right? And then there are the recommendations to go to the library, get yourself them. I started at one point with weekly multiple choice questions on paper in the classroom, which took away at least 20 minutes because by then the numbers were getting bigger, even if it was a 10 minute quiz, it was 20 minutes gone before we get there. So I then moved it into Blackboard and outside of the classroom time. So it was like a I think most of you who have been here did the Blackboard online uh, quizzes. With that, of course, I had more 
questions there on the way, I moved from four exams, which were at that time still what I call homework style, so a large problem. You work through all the problems, four pages of calculations. I said, okay, I'm not here to test if you can write systems of equations from one point to the next and sort it through, but I'm here to test if you can set up electrical engineering equations and for that, I found also multiple choice, choice questions. At the beginning, I made this on paper and scantron sheets. And then in the final year, or two years before Blackboard went out, I went into it and had it also in the classroom. So the students bring their laptop, do it in the classroom, but it's in Blackboard and by not campus. And fall 2014, what? Oh, I want to slide ahead. So what I did in the classroom is short bursts of uh, teaching, right? So and then I tried to, to bring some active learning because I saw the students would fall asleep. They didn't really pay attention. Most of the time I had anyway, only like 50% of the students there. So uh, I had that in hand. I was related problems. So they were like, I explained no voltage analysis. I do one short example. And I said, here's an example. Go do it. But even with 50% of the students and maybe a TA in the class, that's a lot of time to walk through and help the students to work this through and get it done, and that wasn't really great. Um, I tried to get the students to work with each other, but there was no way. They just wanted to be done, and they wanted me to go on, and they were mad at me if I'm not getting to them or whatever. So they didn't ask the neighbors for help, they didn't help their neighbors. There was not really, and even with two, one or two TAs in the classroom, that was not really sustainable over time. So in fall 2014, the enrollment broke my system anyway, because there was enrollment of 135 students in a classroom of 135 students, and there were 10 more students who needed the class right then. Okay. So I was offered to have a TA teach in the second section, but then I said, okay, then I have to teach, teach the TA how to teach the class. So I had a morning session Tuesday, Thursdays at 8 o'clock. Then I had a lunch session as usual at 12.30. Guess what? I still had 135 in the lunch session and only 10 in the morning at 8 o'clock. Nobody from lunch wanted to go there. So it was kind of like in the end, I kind of taught like 45 minutes in the morning. So we started at 8.30. And then I had the full one hour, 15 minutes, because we still did this active learning style in the classroom. And it really did not work out. So that was the point where we had to think, what can we do to change this? I thought about a long time. It was quite often there were questions, okay, can you not put online at least some things, or maybe offer something for the summer. So, in summer 2015, I finally gave in, and I offered the first fully online, and I actually made it. I said, I'm not doing like pieces and bits online. I do it online or not. Otherwise, it would never get done, and you myself, right? So I offered it online. Actually, even that first summer, I taught half of that from Germany, which was good to be online, because otherwise I wouldn't be in the classroom. Um, my lecture verse, which I had, right? I had these snippets already. I translated those into lecture movies, but it was still a lot of rewriting and reorganizing. So it's different if I'm doing it in the classroom, and I can talk to you and see how you react, or I have to make sure everything gets done. But it worked short movies. I think my longest movie, which is my homemade movie, is 10 minutes. Most of them are between two and a half and five minutes. My handouts translated into work examples, so where I gave them a solution, and work on your own, where they had the problem, and just the final solution, where they had to find their way on their own. And then I translated each semester week into a module, because now I had to be more organized and not Otherwise, I would just go in and say, okay, this week we got this far, so next time we start here. Can't do that if you want to make sure you get everything in the classroom, right? So I translated it into a big schedule. And then the summer, the eight-week summer session was that I had two modules per week in that summer session. In these online modules in the summer, I had lecture videos, the ones I just talked about. I have additional YouTube videos, which in the beginning, not so many, but overall, I found that the students really like to have additional material. They did not necessarily watch all of that, but sometimes it was good for them to hear it from a different position 
and look at it from a different way. Uh, the work examples work on your own. In the online version, there is a required participation in the discussion board, which is a fairly unusual thing in engineering. First, what do you do? Discuss, discuss about, right? It's, it's formulas. But it worked out well. They, they talked about they had to write in a statement. So when it was like each module was scheduled for about three days, so after one and a half days, they had to have the first segment in. And then they had to answer a second time. So Saturday night at 6 p.m. when it opened on Thursday morning, Saturday night at 6 p.m. they had to have some kind of statement, question, whatever, anything to do with this problem. And they did not see what the others wrote before they had put in their own statement. And then they had to reply to somebody else once more and give another feedback. And actually the first year that worked very well and there was lively discussion. Some people participated way more than only the twice required by then um, I still have a quiz, the multiple choice quiz. There was homework. Homework was write no big problems on paper. They scanned it in, submitted it into Canvas, and I graded it online. And then I had a multiple choice midterm and final exam. So and that is, were each their own module. So I had 16 modules, and two modules were not all this, but that just exam and revenue for exam. Um, to say at the same time, while I'm preparing all this, that was the summer where it was like, we don't tell you, but most likely we will have Canvas starting in the summer. So I uh, said, okay, it's absolutely not worth trying to develop that and put it in a framework for Blackboard. So I right away, while I learned all this, I also had to learn my way around Canvas. It was kind of like very intense 10 weeks. So. Flipping the classroom, that's what we talk here officially about in this lecture, right? It's like, so how do I flip it? I reuse then many parts of this summer module, right? I still use the videos, the YouTube videos, they're still there. I have the same spacing there, so the modules stay the same only that they're now for a week, right? Um, I do have my examples and my work on your own and homework. Homework I've made a little bit shorter than for those who are online. Of course, now we have the in-class work as well. I do not have a discussion board for a flipped classroom. Of course, we meet in class. I do have a hands-on assignment in class. Again, a midterm and final exam. But this is in class now, where in the summer I let them take it wherever they want. There's a pre and a post quiz. So before they come to the in-class assignment, they have to do a pre-quiz. And then after they're done, they should have done that after the homework, um, there's a post quiz. And then, because I'm putting them into teams, there are peer evaluations so that nobody is sitting there and just waiting that somebody else is doing the work. So that's the kind of framework there. So what I wanted to do then was like, have those teams of students, right, and the students prepare with their videos and so forth. We meet every Tuesday, Thursday, because that's my time slot. Since 2005, I have the same schedule every semester. I'm teaching 12.30, Tuesday, Thursday, 3.05, and at 3.30, I'm teaching my senior design, so that's the schedule. Never break out. On Tuesday, I want to do some kind of paper pencil problems, right, and then on Thursday, I want to do action measurements, which relate to it. And then finish the module afterwards with homework and then post it. Yeah, that's just enrolling. You know, I had 15 students in the summer. I still had over 135 students. So I was sitting there, I wanted to do active learning, I wanted hands on stuff in the summer. Um, I have 146 students to be enrolled in the class. And it doesn't work out. And then finally I started thinking about how do you do this hands on, right? It's, it's, it's how do you deal with them? So and it was like three days before classes start, right? And then I had to make the decision, are you allowing those students in or what do you do with those extra students? So what I did, I called this my airline mode. I'm overbooking my classroom. So I'm enrolling more than I have spots in the classroom. And then I split the class into sections. I have a Tuesday and a Thursday section. They come only one day a week, not two days, but only one day a week. And each section is then split in teams. So I'm ending up with about 
75 to 80 students per section then. And they are split into teams of four to five students. And that's random by canvas. That's just a click. I have nothing to do. They are just sorted together. And that's working out. And then they come only once. So with that, the typical week for my Thursday section, right, looks like this. Like for module 10, right, on Sundays I'm opening up the module and the pre-quiz. So they can start working on that. On Thursday when they're in class, I guess, they have pre-quiz due at noon when we have 12.30 class. Uh, the peer evaluations open at 1.30, so when they're done a little bit early, they can do it right away, otherwise they can do it a little bit later. The post quiz opens and the homework opens right after class. Those peer evaluations are due the next day. And that, even that hasn't changed. I've made a little bit of change this semester, but that hasn't changed. Actually, I leave it open a little bit longer than 2 p.m. I think it's open to midnight now. But it's due the next day because I want them to do it right when they're done with their in-class assignment. And then there is a post-quiz and a homework. And the first two semesters I actually made this due on that Monday. So that they had, because now, if you look for the next week, here quiz 11, or module 11 starts of course on this Sunday. So it's overlapping. With all these deadlines, and a lot of pushback, so what I did this semester, and it seems to work a little bit better, even though the students are not happy anyway. Uh, this here moved on Thursday, the deadline. So now everybody is working like crazy on Thursday morning to get their post quiz from the last week, their homework from the last week, and the pre quiz for this weekend. But I say, okay, that's your scheduling, that's only one deadline. So that's what they do. And then when you see, if I go to my Tuesday section, right? The module actually opens on that same day, also on Sunday, but they're not having their in-class here, but their in-class goes here. But that way they have, where Thursday had four days to prepare, they have more days, but they still have also stuff to do from the previous week. So it's, it's, I think it's evenly distributed in how to deal with it. Again, here's the post quiz one homework was always due on midnight on Saturdays. Again, this semester it's all moved into the Tuesday. So the classroom assignments, the in-class assignment, that's what's really making the flip. Right? So I'm not, I think since I started it, I've never stood in front of the classroom and started teaching. I might make a few announcements, but then they work in their groups. So the original idea of Tuesday's paper and on Thursday's hands-on does not work, right? So I need to include both in those 75 minutes. So when I wanted to have more hands-on than paper because they did hands-on than paper anyway already. And this is of course what you want to have, like, this is what I have, classroom build. So what we start with when I brought in my toys here is I bring the lab into the classroom. So my push card and my TAs. And the first week we bring 16 snap circuits. Right? And then we want to see how these formulas work together. Well, how can I get this together? It's Jacob's card wall there, and how does I, do I see this in here? So uh, we bring in measurement devices. Actually, current measurement is the stupidest idea you can ever have. Of course, my TAs bring in those two weeks where you current measurement. <laughs> At least uh, three hours of changing fuses. But oh well. So they have a short explanation of that and then they do the measurements. And we learn by now if it's not showing anything, it's probably a broken fuse. And then they have <coughs> built a circuit which is given to them in these in these booklets here, and it's it's a toy, it's an educational toy. But it at least, I mean there are these nodes, right, and loops, so they have to draw this in a kind of circuit, describe what they do, do their measurements, and see if this kind of ends up as they expect. And then we did discuss a little bit about how those numbers are not really looking like you would expect to, because most of the time this is not really zero, but slightly different from there. It's 
measurement mistakes and mainly, of course, these connections, of course, are not really ideal. But they do the work. This is what, yes, please. When did you actually start doing the SNAP circuits? Is that this fall? Fall 15. Last fall? Yes. Okay. I started those SNAP circuits in fall 15. That was right away. The first version of that SNAP circuits got in the past. Okay. So all of you who have been in my class will remember this one. The living circuits. Ooh, students have to touch each other. So I bring in together two groups, right? And then they have to build it. They have to make. They are an element. They and one has to sort them, put them in there. Is one of you in those pictures? Um, so they have to build if they're in series and parallel, and then we go around and quickly check if they understand because it's, it's such a great it's a silly exercise, but it's a great exercise because you can tell them if you're in parallel, you hold both hands. If you're in series, you can never hold both hands with the same person. And that's when you look then over their circuits or their drawings, you can say, that's not right, because it's holding both hands. So from there, we have to move on, and then I use the nice way. I actually prepared the courtyard because we're still spending way too much time inside. We went over to breadboards. So that's the next step where these boxes come in. With breadboards and actual little tiny elements, like the resistors in this case, and we use 9 volt batteries. Um, so this is, for example, where I'm introducing no voltage analysis, so they have a circuit, which is hard to see here, but then they have here to build the circuit up and calculate it first, what you expect in values, and then they have to measure and see if the same values. Quite often when I go around and sign off on what they've done so far, I don't really check their values. I mean, if they're totally off, I'm telling them that's not right. But a lot of times we just say, yeah, let's see what you calculate, and then see how that goes together. Because sometimes they don't pay attention to signs, or they misinterpret how certain loops are going or whatever. And then we see, and then it's easier to explain to them to get those two together. So here's an actual when I have Norton Tevlin, right? Then we have this is like a circuit picture I give them. Um, there is my source coming in. Here's it. This is a picture then. I, I had pre-built all these pictures of these step-by-step -step instructions are in Canvas. And in some of these instructions are fairly detailed. Sometimes it's like 30 steps where you have to step through. And in between, there are always checkbox where you says, get a TA or the instructor to sign off. Where we then quickly check are they at the right spot to turn on. So that's all easy. That's easy. Right? There's battery. And then what's the question? What about AC? I need to do at least, well, I'm not sure if anybody was still in that class at that time. Years ago, when I started the 305, we had uh, transistors and diets and motors and logic. And so after midterm, it was like boom, 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 one lecture, one topic. And I don't think anybody ever understood anything of those. So at one point, we reduced it back and we mainly do AC, it's DC and AC. And a little bit of operational amplifiers in that direction, but that at least we hope they understand them better. So how do we see? And that's where we bring in the digital and explorables. And that's where we're in the class right now. And when we started after midterm, we started the explorables. It's essentially a lab on your computer. We have these, the boards. I bring those in the classroom with the boxes. Mm -hmm. And the students install the free software on their computers. And it's available for Mac, for Windows, for all different kinds, so that works out. And then they have here, they have a signal generator and an oscilloscope, and they can all click this, and then they can work with this. So what we did this past week is an RL circuit. So we have an inductor here. My bars were in parallel, just because I need a specific value there. And then they are given a frequency, and my first frequency is given in a way so that my R and L value, if you look at just the ohms, are about the same. So what this frequency, actually the input frequency here, and then those other two are symmetric around it. And then we let them play a little bit with frequencies, and they see that it shifts away. This is the original, so it shifts here and here. 
in the two directions and they are supposed to look at it and tell me a little bit how it, we do it once with an L and one with, so with an inductor and once with a capacitor. That way they can get both of those. Um, we do also then with the same setup here the operational amplifier where they actually get some signals and amplify that and look at that. What happens? What happens if we have a uh, non inverting or an inverting amplifier? And they are kind of supposed to predict how the curves will look like afterwards. And there were a few aha moments when negative doesn't mean it's less amplified, but an inverting amplifier means it actually flips the sine curve. Um, that's I think it's a good thing that they have these aha moments because they actually see it then. And then we have in the end, just to give them a little bit to make up there, a little fun project where we do a little piano thing and they do music in the classroom. It's not a lot. We don't I actually use this digital board here only because I need power. Uh, otherwise, I could build it on a regular board as well. It's just because that's the last thing we have all the time. So, looking back over this first year, so I have you now taught the online version twice. The flipped classroom version I had, I'm now on the third iteration of that. And um, so the back, looking back is making short movies, really, really fun. It's a lot of work. I would spend like 10 weeks in my summer, seven days a week, eight to 10 hours every day just doing that. My Fitbit showed most days 2,000 steps because I walked down, sat on my desk, walked to the kitchen back and forth, but that was all I did. So it was really, it was incredible amount of work. And sometimes students come and say, oh, she could have made a better movie, and why doesn't she improve it here? It's like, yeah, just, just make that movie. Mm -hmm. um, important is I have one and a half TAs. It's important, it's not one and a half. I want three half TAs because I need bodies in the classroom, right? So I rather have three half TAs and who are all with me in the classroom. They must be available during my class time so they can go with me into the classroom. Implementation was about a year. I think most of the kinks are out now. Of course, I'm adjusting quite some stuff. Always the the big things are done now. Um, but. Whereas this sounds like it's one year, I know that I have been asked for quite some time to maybe do one or two online modules. So I had quite often started thinking about what could you do, how would you do it. So it's not that I started last summer then and said everything is here. There was a lot of thought process before that, before I even started with this. Um, the, at least the first time, there was a lot of assembly line kind of work to prep those boxes. Um, what we do now is actually, when we're done and we're switching the boxes, everything goes in Ziploc bags and then in bags for a module. And then the next semester we'll bring it out, double check that still everything is in there, which is supposed to be in there. But we don't have to do actually this here. The first semester was a lot of like counting in like those five resistors or whatever. So that that's a little bit better now. Um, Transportation is not easy. I'm in FPAT. I teach in the classroom building. Um, so I might now have a big card. In the beginning I had a little card and some of my stuff dropped off. On my um, I still don't like rain. It's, it's not great. And usually when we have these boxes here, the bottom is full with extension cords. Of course we need to string tons of extension cords through the classroom so they can actually work there. And um, just quickly going back there to my classroom, there, my classroom slide here. Um, you think it's bad here. The only thing what is worse than this is what I officially have next semester is the classroom building and classroom next door. Of course, those are the ones with the little tables to bring out. And where I tell them here, okay, yes, three here, two in front, work together on those, bring those little tables out, they will not work. So I will have to work with somebody to get me out of this classroom, at least in this one. I mean, I would love to have one of these new classrooms with cameras or whatever. I don't have those, right? But this is bad, 
but much better than the other two. So, so in conclusion, it is possible to bring the lab in there. Uh, I think for in-depth assignments, it's not great. I mean, if you really want to do great experiments, you have to do it in a real lab. But there's basic instructions possible. Seems that overall the students have fun during these assignments in class assignments, and it's kind of like before they all thought it's boring class, 